All right, so I guess we're ready to get going. So welcome, everybody. My name is Mark Zeter. I am the publisher, editor, I don't know, whatever you call it, of uh, XDev Magazine. We're the only uh, X Zojo based, I mean, Zojo oriented publication in the world. We've been publishing continuously since 2002, so over 20 years, back when it was real basic and real studio and all the other variations. And uh, we also do uh, XDev Library, which is a sister site that uh, basically you can buy individual articles and books and things like that, sort of a la carte versus getting a subscription to the magazine. The magazine is basically you get emailed a link to the PDF to download every uh, six times a year. So every other month you get a, you get a PDF. And we are doing a special with uh, the conference where you can get 20% off your subscription with the code MBS. 2024, so you might want to take advantage of that. Now it's going to be good through the next through the, through May, so you can do it anytime you want. But basically, normally I publish May 1st, which would be in a few days. But I'll probably delay it. Hopefully, I'm going to try to get it published by next Friday, and uh, write about this conference. So if you want to see yourself in pictures and stuff, you want to get a subscription so you can see yourself in the magazine. <laughs> but uh, today I'm going to talk about design patterns. Uh, I did a talk on design patterns last year, about the same time of year at the London conference, and that was my first delve into design patterns. I really hadn't you know, researched them and studied them. I'd kind of used a few and lift, picked up a few things, but hadn't really looked at it in depth, and, and I really enjoyed learning about them and, and, and trying to understand them better. And so when Christian invited me to this conference, I said, well, you know, i got to come up with a topic, and I thought, there's lots of design patterns. What I'll do is I'll just take that talk and extend it and do some more design patterns. So last time I talked about factory pattern and things like that. Today we're going to look at some other patterns and I'll basically most of this is going to be demos in Zojo showing you some projects and I'll have a link at the end where you can download those projects and look at the code and play with it on your own as much as you would like. So before we begin, uh, I'm just going to reiterate a little bit of background uh, of object oriented programming. Just give you a little quick refresher because one of the things I discovered with you know design patterns is design patterns and object-oriented programming are part of the same package. You can't separate the two. Design patterns require object-oriented programming and they help you basically force you to do object-oriented programming, which is one of the things I actually like about them. But uh, that means you kind of have to understand uh, a little bit of a good background. So if you're not that familiar with uh, object-oriented programming, I'll give you a quick little five-minute overview. But the uh, biggest, thing, biggest thing about uh, OOP is all of our projects change, right? This is, the, this is the key thing with any kind of programming project, either it's for yourself, it's for a client, it's for you know, a boss. You start one way, it ends up being a completely different project a few years down the road or a few months down the road. Um, you, you know, customers want new features, you want to add new features, and you start looking at your code that you had before, and it worked great for that particular feature set and what you were doing, and then when you try to add new features, it, nothing works, right? You got to go back in and rewrite stuff. So the whole purpose of OOP is to help you manage change and make change easier to do so that you can make those changes without having to break the rest of your program and kind of have to start over. So one of the ways that OOP does this is with decoupling your code. We've all seen, you know, spaghetti code, where the old days you would, you know, in the old days you'd use go-tos and really mess up your app. But even today, you can still make apps that lots of different parts of your code talk to the other parts, and they're all tied together. And that can work for the current version of the program, but once you go to make changes, all of a sudden, everything's talking to everything else, and you have to make changes all over the place to add the new feature. With OOP, the whole idea is you have a nice structure. Objects don't talk to each other. They, they, they communicate in some sort of a system, which could be a design pattern. And that helps force you to keep everything kind of separate so that when you add a new feature, you don't break all of the other things that were in that. You also, with OOP, you end up encapsulating your code and sometimes your data so that everything's kept separate. And again, it's the same type of thing. The more your code is isolated and separated, the less um, tying together of, of disparate parts of your code you have. And so that way, when you want to make a change or make an addition, you're not making changes throughout the program, you're just making changes to that one particular area. So 
The four key things that you do with OOP, uh, we have a, the abstraction layer, which is basically just the object metaphor. When we call stuff objects, it's not literally an object, it's just a metaphor, right? It's just an object. Uh, we have inheritance, which we've all used probably, where you have the super and the subclasses. You have polymorphism, which uh, I used real basic for, I don't know, maybe 10 years before I figured out what interfaces were, which is polymorphism. And once I discovered them, I'm like, these are so cool. Because <laughs> basically, and, and, and what we're gonna learn today about um, design patterns, if you haven't used design patterns, design patterns uh, depend a lot on uh, interfaces. When I first got started, I thought super and subclasses, you know, inheritance was, 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 was the key thing, right? You, you create an object and then your children, you know, inherit the same behaviors and, and that's really cool. But then I found out about interfaces and interfaces are really cool because they let one object pretend to be another object, right? So I've got a little diagram here of the Groucho Marx glasses, right? Because the, the interface makes the one object appear to be something else. And then you can, you can have a routine and you can pass objects into it and you don't, it doesn't matter if it's a different kind of object because as long as it has the right interface, it can pretend to be that object and be allowed into that and you can pass things back and forth. And that's really powerful and we use that, almost every design pattern uses that. We also, like I mentioned earlier, encapsulation and uh, you know, decoupling your code. And so those are some key OOP features. What are design patterns? Well, I find that the best way to look at design patterns is to see what they're not. So they're not really, they're not an algorithm, right? An algorithm is your, your plan of you know, how you're gonna solve a problem, but that's not what a design pattern is. It's not really a plug-in. It's not like something you stick in your program and add to your project and now it does something. It's not a template where you bring a template in and fill in the blanks and now it does something. It's not a blueprint where you have this hard-coded thing and say, okay, it's gonna fit, ex you know, we're gonna design it exactly like this. Design patterns are a lot more flexible than that. And uh, I came up with three different names. This is just my own terminology, but I, they're kind of like guidelines, right? They're just, we're gonna head this direction and kind of kind of go that way. Uh, you could also call it a technique. I'm gonna use a particular pattern and it's, it's just technique that I'm gonna follow. My favorite look at it is to think of it as a strategy. So I put here a little diagram of a chessboard because what I like about the concept of a strategy is a strategy can change, right? You're playing chess with somebody and you realize, you know, what I'm doing is not working, <laughs> I'm losing, uh, you, you change the strategy and you try something different and maybe that works better. And that's kind of what a design pattern should be, right? It shouldn't be this hard-coded thing where you're like, okay, I'm gonna code my program this way and there's no other way to do it and I just have to, you know, do it this way. Well, every program's a little bit different and when I first started reading about design patterns, I'm thinking, oh, you, you know, you've gotta follow these rules and do it exactly like this and it's like, no, actually, it's just, it's just a general strategy, just a general technique, and as long as you follow some of the key things in that technique, you can modify it for whatever your particular case is. And once I realized that, it's like, it's really freeing, and it's really relaxing, because it's like, okay, I don't feel so restricted, like I have to follow this specific you know, plan, I can, I can adjust it for my specific program. And then I'm much more uh, likely to use a design pattern, because you know, I, I go, well, my program, you know, you see somebody do an example of a design pattern, you're like, well, my program isn't quite like that. How can I adapt that to my program? Well, you can adapt it and, and figure out how it works for your program. You don't have to worry about, like, I have to do exactly the way that person did it. So anything I present here today, you know, feel free to change it and adapt it in whatever your particular needs are, because you will find that it needs that, because everybody's project is different, you know? So. Design patterns actually, um, they sound like a fancy, you know, design patterns, like a fancy, fancy thing, but really all they are is, it's just somebody, the people who originally sort of discovered design patterns, they basically just studied a whole bunch of programmers, and they were not, you know, they were different programmers from all over the, all the world, I think, and basically said, well, these guys are doing this over here, and these guys are doing the same, same thing, but in a slightly different way, but it's basically the same concept, and, we need a way to name that. So basically design patterns is just a naming system to call it something so that you can say, well, you know, I've got a factory pattern, I've got this pattern, I've got that pattern. You can just name it and we can talk the same language, but we know we're talking about the same thing. So really, it's not scary, it's just simply a name for techniques that programmers were already using for a long time. Um, design patterns are, they're not magic cure-alls, they're not something you can just, you know, add to your program or wave in your program and all of a sudden all your problems are gone. 
they require planning and discipline to use. So you really have to, you know, focus that and look at it and go, okay, I've got it, you know, I've got a design pattern, I want to use it this way. Um, and then you never think about it again. No, that doesn't work. You have to constantly think about, okay, you know, this is my, my pattern, this is how I have to communicate with these objects and do it this way. And then you have to continue that throughout the rest of your structure program. If you only half use a design pattern, you kind of have set, you set it up and then you don't really use it everywhere and you kind of make some cheats and things, you basically lose all the benefits of having the pattern in the first place. You just created extra work to create extra objects and extra structure and then you didn't really follow through and it might as well not be using the design pattern because you're not gonna gain the benefits that you get from it. Well, what are the benefits of using a design pattern? Why should you use them? Well, it's a lot of the same things you find with, with object-oriented programming. You have reliability, you have reusa reusability, um, you have simpler program structure and clarity. What I really like about a lot of these patterns is they force you to um, set up your program in a way that's very clear where the communication is. This object's talking to this one, or this, you know, you've got a, 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 a strategy for how they're, how they're gonna communicate. Uh, it's also flexibility, right? You, by whole, whole point of this is when there's change and things happen, you've got a setup for how you can adapt to that. Uh, better code encapsulation, and my favorite is just, it forces you, when you use a design pattern, it forces you to use a more object-oriented design. It's very easy for, uh, most of my stuff's kind of hobbyist kind of projects that I do. I don't really do commercial thing, and you know, the magazine is kind of my main thing. But uh, I'll start a project, I'm thinking I want this to be you know, object-oriented, I'm gonna set it up right. Then I start getting into it, and it's like just kind of brute force, hard code, whatever I'm trying to do. <laughs> and I kind of fall out of habit. So one advantage I like about using a design pattern is it forces you to think in, a, in, a, in an OOP fashion so that you're making your whole program much more object-oriented and just kind of concentrating on that. And that's, it just naturally happens when you're using the pattern. And uh, it also, by the same token, forces you to decouple your code because if you're setting it up, in a new fashion, you get that benefit. So those are some really good benefits to design patterns. Uh, there's some times you shouldn't use design patterns. Uh, if your program is really small, a lot of design patterns require a lot of setup, and you set up a bunch of objects and a whole you know, communication system between the objects or whatever you're doing, depending on the pattern, and you've just done a lot of work, and then you know, it's a small program that doesn't really need you know, need all that work. Um, if you have a tiny program, you know, that's not gonna change. Sometimes there's little one-off programs or just such a simple program, or you know, it's just a program. I and mean, there are some programs I'm contradicting myself because earlier I said, you know, all programs change, but there are some programs that don't change enough to warrant using, uh, you know, design patterns. And you also don't wanna use design patterns just because you wanna look cool and be like, you know, hey, everybody's using design pattern. I wanna use design pattern, you know? And, have that buzzword just like AI, you know, let's throw AI and everything. You know? <laughs> uh, that's not really a good motivation for design patterns. That part I said earlier about having to be disciplined in how you use design patterns and, and you know, focused and everything, that's a part of this. So if, you're, if your motivation for using design patterns is just, you know, well, I was, somebody said it was a good thing to have design patterns, so I'm, you know, I've read about this pattern, I'm gonna try it, and you know, you're not, your motivation for, for using it is not, I wanna make my code better and make things easier to use, you're just thinking, you know, I want to do something that somebody said was good. And uh, that's not a good motivation. You're not going to stick with it and uh, use it when it gets, uh, you know, harder. So there are basically three categories of design patterns. There's behavioral, structural, and creative. So behavioral basically controls, like, some of your, your the structure, the, 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 how, your, how your program behaves, the, the, way that it, the way that it does things. Structural kind of helps you organize your, your code, and creative helps you uh, create objects and things. So at the London talk I did uh, factory and by the way I think I think the London talk is available on the Zojo channel I think they put all those videos for last year's conference on the on their YouTube channel So you could download that and watch that if you want to read more about the hear more about the other patterns I talked about last time, but today I'm going to talk about the facade pattern and the structural and then I'm also going to look at observer and command Those are the three patterns we're going to cover today so now we're going to get into talking about those patterns, and uh, the, I'm going to show you through these three different demos of those, if everything works right. So <laughs> uh, we'll start with the facade pattern. This one is actually, I read about this and I'm like, holy cow, I've been using this pattern for decades, <laughs> and I didn't even know it. Uh, I, I, probably most of you have actually used it. 
uh, if you didn't even realize it. But basically all a facade pattern is, it's designed to provide basically a simpler interface to a more complicated API. So the example I use, very pertinent since we just had the talk from David about making PDFs, the example I'm using is actually the uh, WK HTML to PDF uh, command line tool, which uh, he mentioned is, is one of the, that's what he's using in the background on his thing. So um, this down here at the bottom of the demo, which I'll get into more in a minute, but that's basically the, the, the command that it would require sent to it, and you can see it looks very tedious and complicated. And a lot of times we don't need all those options you know, for that API. And this could be, I used to use this as an example because it was one I already had, but one that I'd like to create that I haven't really done yet because I haven't had a huge need for it, but there's perfect examples. There's another command line tool called, what's it called, FF MPEG or whatever. It's a, it's a video, a lot of it like Handbrake and things like that use that uh, to convert videos and stuff in the background. They have a command line version of that. And uh, from what I've read, it's, you know, gives you a million options converting from every video format and sizes and whatnot. And I'm like, you know, I just want a little simple tool possibly in my program where I could hit a button and it would just, you know, convert it to a standard simple format, you know, one thing to another or something. And I thought this would be a perfect example of using a facade for that. You'd set up having to try to, you know, incorporate all the details of the huge, you know, complicated API into your program, just create a facade that just makes it really easy for you to send something very simple. And uh, so that's another example. And it could be, it could also be an API for a web service, basically anything that you need to talk to another thing and it's got some kind of a, you know, structure, you can create a simplified version for it. There's a few advantages for that, which I'll get to in a second, but this is an example of a very, this is actually a very simple <laughs> shortened command uh, for um, WK, but uh, I basically made all the file names pretty short and didn't put spaces in there. And normally they all have to be escaped and you know, we have spaces in there and other punctuation. And, and uh, this isn't doing too much, but it's putting you know, a few different things about the margin sizes and page sizes. And it's got a, a footer and some information and table of contents style sheet it's pulling in and then it's creating a book at the end basically. But uh, obviously if you get one character wrong in this, a command doesn't work. <laughs> so when you try to set these up by hand, it's like, okay, I'm gonna screw up. This is my class and you can see, I don't know if any of you, that to me this is a lot simpler. <laughs> this is Zojo code, I can handle this. Uh, so basically all this does is mask that from you. But one of the key advantages of this, just, just like uh, David was saying in his presentation, how he uses WK in the background and you can always kind of replace that engine. One of the key advantages of using a facade, regardless of what you're, you're hiding in front, is you, you're basically creating your own sort of mini API to whatever that service is, right? So you, you create a few simple commands, you know, I'm talking to it like this and, and it knows, you know, these, these, these few commands that's, that's the front there. If you later decide, well, WK stops working, right? It hasn't been maintained, or it's an open source um, command line tool, it hasn't been maintained in a while, maybe it stops working. I could switch this to another thing, like Zojo's built-in PDF service, or uh, Christian's plugins, or something else. And I wouldn't have to change any of the other code in my program, all I have to change is my class here that actually does the talking to whatever engine I'm using in the background. And so to me, that's really powerful because normally if you tie your stuff too close to the, um, the original thing, then you're, you're stuck with that service. You know, it's a lot of work to switch to a different service. So I actually recommend anytime you're using any API, set up your own class between that and the API. So you're not talking directly to the API, you're talking to your class, your class then talks to the API. And then that just makes things simpler and you know, you've got that little buffer between you two and it's, it's a really good way to do it. So I think I'm gonna go ahead and uh, show you a uh, demo here. Let me, uh, where did my, uh, I guess I closed up my folder here. All right, so here's facade. All right, so I'll show you my little program. I'll just run this first. While that's loading up, I'm gonna close some of my windows here. So I'm, 
All right, so I've got a little testing folder here of some things. I'll just show you how this works. So this first one is actually gonna, let's see, I'll put on the footer so we can see pages. This one takes like a minute to run when I tested it earlier on the slow Wi-Fi here in this conference room. So while that's running, I'll talk to you a little bit. But uh, basically, I just this is just a demo project, so it's not meant to be particularly user friendly. But what I did is I, um, you actually have to put in the full path to each file, and the top one is your source, and the bottom one is your your PDF target, and you have a few options like header and footer, and you can turn on table of contents. Some of these don't always work for all of the different um, formats you're using. For example, table of contents, I don't even do it if you're just doing a simple, like this one here's pulling an actual, it's going to my website and pulling that website. And this, this creates like a 46 page <laughs> H, uh, uh, um, PDF. So looks like it's taking its time here. So we'll see how long it takes. Ah, oh, there it goes. Okay. So just for debugging purposes, I, I put in this bottom stuff. Normally you wouldn't, you know, show that to your customer or whoever, you know, the, the client. It was all, this all happens in the shell in the background. But just for the purposes of debugging, I, I put in the information here so it gives us some information about you know, what all it's doing. And, and, uh, and then down here at the very bottom, see there's page 46. So if we go over here and look at this PDF, this is what it looks like. I turned on the page number so it tells us down here page 2 of 46. And this is just the XDev library website, which it's just a long list of things you can buy, articles and books, and you just you know, click on the purchase price. But I just thought it was fun example to use um, showing you how you can pull a URL out and create a PDF from it. And uh, you can see it, it's actually pretty smart. It puts the, the title at the top like that. See how it stays? The title at the top is on every page. And it doesn't break any of the books between. It actually is smart enough to keep everything kind of together. And uh, it's, yeah, it's pretty cool. But uh, we can also go in here, whoops, did I just hit Command Q? Um, I was trying to hit Command A. <laughs> so basically, what I did, what I discovered is if you uh, take a file, if this is empty, it works. If it's not empty, but it, if you just drop a file in there, it it actually puts in the full the full path to it, which is really cool. And uh, you can do the same if if you if there's already text there, it adds to it, so it kind of is confusing. So I just make sure it's empty. And this one here will turn on, I don't think table contents works on this one, but we'll do, we'll just turn on the header and the footer. This one's really quick, so. Um, so this one's just a single page. And uh, okay, so it just put a, the, the, the header at the top is the same page number that I set up. So I made this normally with, with WK, you can set it, you can, you can have really complicated headers and footers that do stuff, but again, the whole purpose is to simplify things. One danger you can have with a facade pattern is if you make the facade pattern do everything that, it, that the main thing is supposed to do, um, you basically recreated that other API. So it's now, you know, not really a facade, it's a complicated thing. So you wanna be a little careful about um, adding too many features, but I just made it so you can turn a header footer on or off and that's all you need to do, you know. So this one here is the book one. And what this does is I just have a folder here, if you guys can see this. Yeah, you can see that on the big screen. Um, so it's just a collection of, of HTML files there. And when I hit like that, this one will actually create a table contents. And my favorite thing is these are automatically hot. So if I click on it, it jumps to chapter three. And you've got the page numbers at the bottom and uh, just creates a simple, simple little PDF. It's really cool. So anyway, let's take a quick look at how this facade works. Again, like I said, this is probably something you've all kind of done something like this. You weren't necessarily thinking about it as, you know, I'm creating a, uh, a facade. But basically, you just have a simple class over here called WKH class. And we've got a few properties. Some of them are private. But we set those private ones via the interface that I set up. For example, we have um, the... Uh, make PDF command, which is the, the main one that we do. And uh, there's also some commands, for example, set margins and set page size. So you can feed in. And by default, like it uses millimeters. Uh, WK uses millimeters as the measurement. And uh, being American, I often want to use inches. And so uh, I set mine up. There's an inches 
inches as Boolean. So if you want it, you can pass true, and then it'll, whatever numbers you're using, it'll convert them to, to millimeters for you automatically, as it does right here with a little bit of math. And uh, same thing for the set margins. But the main stuff is all on this command here that's called make PDF. And it just wants a folder item and then the name of the, the target PDF that you're creating to. And we create, a, we create a shell. It creates this whole that whole long string command that you saw that we send to, uh, to WK. And we've got, uh, if it, it checks to see if it's a directory, if it's a directory, it's going to load up all the items in that, in that book um, and combine them together. And there's a few things here, you know, adding in the page sizes and different things. And you have to, with, with WK, you have to do stuff in a certain order um, or it, it doesn't, if you pass like the page size in the wrong spot, it's not gonna recognize it. So, which is one of the things that's very tedious to get it exactly right. So it's really cool once you've got it in your class and it's working, then it just works. You don't have to <laughs> think about it. And this is the else that does the, if it's just a single page, single page file, it, it does all this. And uh, it's, it's, it's really pretty simple. It's, it's, you know, I almost feel embarrassed at such a simple example, but um, so all we do here. Uh, so what I actually did here is I actually, um, actually embedded the, for the example, I actually embedded, um, I think that's on the, should be in here. I've got the, resources folder. I thought it's in here. Where is that? Uh, maybe I just look in the folder. Um, yeah, I actually embedded the uh, WK um, code. I mean, the, 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 there it is, the resources folder here. So I've actually included that in here. And so um, that command line tool is actually embedded into the project so that you can just run it and it'll find it and, and execute it. Um, and uh, this is the part, okay, so the action one is just, this is where, you, where it's actually calling the class, setting up the headers, if those are used, whatever the value is, it sets those. Checks here, if it's actually begins with HTTP, then it actually just sends that URL to the, to the command because you don't need any of the other complicated options, you're just converting a web page, so it's very simple. And down here, is where if it's it figures out if it's a folder, um, or if it's you know if it's actual text. You, you can also tell it if it's uh, you can actually put um, with this command. You can actually there's a, a second version of it uh, on the make PDF that just takes the actual command. So you can actually just create your own command string by hand if you wanted to. You don't have to use the the uh, simplified version. So you could do it you could do it manually if you wanted to, but. Um, any questions about that? Is that pretty simple? Oh, okay. So you're, you're suggesting a builder pattern where you build one command onto another and so you have part one, part two, part three kind of thing. And, and that's, you could do that, yeah. Yeah, that would be another way to to do this, because that basically this command line string is kind of like little parts, so you could that would be another strategy to do that. But again, I'm just I just picked this WK class as an example of a side because I'd already I'd already created it for other projects, so I just thought it would be a simple example to demonstrate a facade as a simple uh, you know API behind the scenes. But yeah, that's one of the cool things about design patterns is there's there's lots of different patterns. There's a lot of variations, and uh, oftentimes just a slight variation of what you're doing, you know, works just as well, or it might work better for your particular project. So, next I'll talk about the observer pattern, and this is one that uh, I've been wanting this pattern for a long time because I've had quite a few projects where I was in a situation where I really want I wanted to know when a particular variable changed. And there's normally no way to know that, right? You, I mean, you could, you could put a timer and just like check that periodically. Did it change? Did it change? Did it change? You know, <laughs> you could wrap it in some kind of object and, and then try to, you know, create an event that happens when it changes or something. There's a lot of complicated ways. I never quite, you know, did it. But turns out there's an actual design pattern, which is way better than what anything I was trying to create. And uh, what's really cool about a design pattern is, well, there's two, two key things with it. One is more than one object 
can subscribe to that to that property to that to that thing that you want to monitor, and they can basically say, "Hey, tell me when you change, right? Tell me when there's any change on you." And you can have dozens of objects watching, you know, that object or any other object, whatever you you know, however you want to set it up. So it gives you a really powerful thing. The other part that's really neat is that these all happen in real time. So basically, they can subscribe for a period of time and then turn off and stop subscribing, or they can, you know, come back later and you know, on or off, whatever. It's all it all happens at runtime. So it's nothing that you have to hard code in your program. These guys always, you know, watch these guys or whatever. It happens dynamically as you run your program. So you could, you have a situation. You could peer out, you know, watch this for a little while, and then when you don't need to watch it, turn it off, and you don't you don't get those notifications. But that's basically what we're going to set up in the demo. And let me. I think I got one more screen here. Yeah. So the way that we do this is uh, might look a little complicated, a lot of text here, but it's it's really fairly simple. So the first thing we do is we have what's called a subscriber type. Uh, this is just a thing that I do. I put the word type at the end of my uh, interface names. Um, just basically, when I see that type on the end, it tells me that it's an interface. And so. Subscriber type is an interface. It, the only thing that's required is a, a method called update that gets called whenever the property, the watch property changes. Then we have something called publisher class. And publisher class is the actual object. It's going to contain whatever you're trying to watch. And it has a, a data property that is a computed property. So it has a get and a set. And basically, it also has methods for subscribing and unsubscribing. And so when a watch variable changes, all the subscribers are notified. This is the routine. This is how simple the this notify subscriber. It just goes through each subscriber and calls its update method. Because keep in mind, all the subscribers are subscriber type. And so they all have an update method and get called. And that's, that's how you notify the subscribers. Then they all get, get notified. And uh, they can do whatever they want with that information. And as I said before, they can subscribe or unsubscribe at runtime. So it gives you a very powerful method to uh, work with that. So what we're going to do, let me close up this other project. And I'll open up this one here. So there's the demo project. So what I did here is we have, um, actually, I'll just show you a little code first. So I'm going to go over here to the opening, because this is where we set everything up. So basically, I, have three pub I create three, three classes of publisher class. And even though I'm calling a publisher class, I'm just doing that for clarity so that you realize that that's an object that's publishing its information. Um, but it's, it's basically the, it's what we're trying to monitor, right? So that's the object that we want to we keep a track of. In this case, um, it has a, a property called data, which is a variant. So you could put anything you want in there, any kind of object, any, 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 any data type. I put in there an integer. And so here I'm just saying new publisher class. I give it a name, and I give it a value. right? So we've got three integers. And then for each of these integers, I've got two other objects. I've got the list box object, and the I created a, a little graph with the chart control. And uh, so we've got chart observer and LB observer. They subscribe to all, all three properties, so six lines of code. And then we just stick the string value into, that, into those um, text fields so that they can you know, get the information. So I'll just hit run here, and we'll see this live as we make changes. So I like this. You go over here to like this one here. We take off a 0, and you'll see instantly the graph changes, the value in the list box changes. And obviously, you could, you could hard code this and you know, do it the traditional way where you know, if something changes, you know, go, go change, you know, refresh those things or change something. But again, this is happening with messages. So the cool thing is I can turn these off. So if I unsubscribe here and I change this, nothing happens. Now, the value is still changed. I'm, I'm still changing the value. It's just not telling anybody that it changed. So if I change this one here that we're still subscribed to, the other ones will get notified, and that property, too, will update because I'm, I'm refreshing those whole controls. So. You know, it's not like the value doesn't, just because I am not subscribed to it, it's not like the value doesn't actually change. Um, but we just don't get the notification. Once, once, once they refresh for any reason, they would show the current value, which would be different. But I like that you can just turn it on, on and off the subscription values, and anything you change here 
you know, automatically does stuff. So I made it so it's just, it, it all, these text fields have a uh, mask feature or whatever, they, six, six digits is the max they'll take. So I just made it for real simplicity. So you can't put decimals or anything in there. And it's just real simple. But anything you, you change here on that just gets, if we go to the text change setting here, really we're just, we're just uh, getting the integer value from the text field and then we're just storing it into data, which is the property of that publisher class object. So if you see at the bottom there, it says publisher class. That's what property one is and property two, they're publisher class objects. And since we subscribe to those, once those change, because those are set up, if we go down here to publisher class, we have several methods here and our properties. So data is the, a variant like that. And uh, let's see, where's the, okay, there's the constructor that sets it up. Ah, here's what I'm looking for, property is data. Okay, so get, just so it, it stores it internally as mData, and then we just return mData, and if you wanna set it, it's just saying mData equals whatever the value is that has been set, but here's the key thing is, the data has changed potentially, I could have put in a code there to actually see if it really actually changed because you theoretically could have it be the same value, but for simplicity's sake, I just left it like this. So then it just calls notify subscribers and then it goes to that code that I showed you earlier where each subscriber gets, their update method gets called and they go, oh, that value changed. Now I can do whatever I need to do you know, with that information, whether it's updating a, you know, a display of some kind, kind of like what we're doing here, you know, updating the graph, whatever. Um, basically, that's how, that's how simple this is. And I was like, this is really cool. And once you get your basic class set up, it's like you can just add that into any project. And since that variable data you know, can contain anything, you could literally monitor an object, monitor you know, whatever you want to monitor and keep, keep an eye on things. And uh, you get a notification and you do whatever you need to do with that result. Any questions about that? Is that pretty? Pretty clear? You think you'll find that useful? Um, I uh, just remember a number of times when I had projects where I ran into situations where I really wanted, wanted to, you know, to get information when, when something changed, and that's a great way to do that. So, all right, third pattern we're gonna cover is called the command pattern. And uh, this one, when I read about it, I was like, oh, this sounds really cool. Uh, it turned out it was a little bit more work to set it up than I thought. It's a little bit, there's a few aspects of it a little strange, but the coolest thing about this, so basically what we're doing is we're creating, um, so any program you have, you have things that the program does, that the user has integrated, like, you know, they, they pull it out menu command and they say, you know, do whatever. And um, that's basically a command that the program needs, to, you know, it needs to go and execute and do that. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna package that into a command object that has all the data and everything that it needs to execute that command. And what this, and then we can basically queue that, we can send it to another object, we can queue it up, and uh, there's value in that, like if you had a, a slow system, let's doing stuff online or whatever, and there's, you never know, you know, the speed of stuff, you could queue up the commands and they could happen later. Uh, I can imagine a situation like, say, you know, like editing a, a photo or something like that, you could, you know, chain the commands of what they're, what you're doing later. And then you can also, because you've got this chain of commands, you can just go backwards and undo those. So it gives you a way to do really easy support for undoable operations. And I've added undo into some of my programs in the past and I usually start the program out and I'm just, you know, trying to get the program to work and I do it and then I go, ah, dang, I'm starting to use the program. I'm like, I really wish this thing I had to undo because <laughs> I'm, I'm running into situations where I want to undo what I just did. And then like, okay, let's go back to the program and start adding an undo. And it's a huge pain because uh, I get the undo and it's like the undo works like 80% of the time because I, I got it working in this part, but then there's a few other parts of my program that are also making changes to data that I'm not really tracking and it's like a mess and it ends up being you know, really hard to add undo later. So I created it for this, and I didn't actually add the undo until I had gotten the basics of the, the command um, pattern working. And then I'm like, okay, now I got, and I got that working, that's good. And then I'm like, now I gotta add the undo. And it's like, oh, 
it works. <laughs> it was like, it was super easy to add the undo. So um, I, I'm really excited about this. So the example I'm using here, uh, one of the other advantages of this pattern, because you're queuing up operations, there's a lot of, pub, a lot of apps or you know, programs where you're doing stuff where you have multiple ways of executing the same command. So I set up this little program here. So we've got a toolbar, as you can see in the top there. And the toolbar lets you move the mouse left to right, up or down. And there's also a menu bar, and you can choose left, up, right, or down from the menu. And I also implemented keyboard commands, so you can use the arrow keys to move the mouse left. Those are all doing the same thing. So normally, we'd probably like, you could duplicate the code in three places, which doesn't make any sense. You could create a method that you're calling from all those, which is OK, but the method's not really in an object, and it's not really you know, structured the way that it, it's the ideal way to do it. The way that we're going to do it is with by, by Packaging those commands into a command pattern uh, makes it really easy to track those movements and makes it really easy to add. If you wanted to add, say, a, a, a contextual menu pop up or some other way of, you know, you could tilt the laptop or your device and it would make the mouse move. <laughs> uh, you could just add that and, and, and that would, you could support that really easily because all you do is just, you know, capture that input method and then use the same command that you've already using with the other ones. So the way this works, uh, like I said, it gets a little tedious, a little complicated. We start off again with uh, another interface. This is called the command type. Uh, class interface that represents a, a command object. It has three required methods. You have to have execute, which runs the command. You have to have name, which is, I added this for me. This is, this is not in the original pattern that I read about. But uh, for the undo operations, I love it when you have a program and you're going to undo. And a lot of programs, you go to undo, and it's just undo, and you're like, what am I undoing? <laughs> Is it a, you know did it did I do something else in the interim before I did you know I like it when it says you know undo last you know text typing or undo you know whatever you did, undo you know undo it tells you what you're undoing and that's just clarity. So basically, I added a name property. So when you're setting up your command, you give it a name, and then when you go to undo, it uses that name to display what you're undoing. So in the case of the mouse moving, it would say, undo, move left. And you go, oh, OK, yeah, I want to undo, move left. That's what I want to do. And so it just helps a lot. The other one you have to have is the actual undo command, which basically, again, the command itself in this package knows how to do whatever the, whatever the action is. It also needs to know how to undo it, right? So um, and. Basically, we, we have this thing called sender class, and this is what we actually use to package up the command and send it. So it has a set command, which basically stores the command, and an execute command to actually execute the command. So bear with me, I've got like two more screens because this, this one's a little complicated. So the way that we set this up, uh, in this particular case, I've got three types of actions that we're going to be doing. So we've got move, reset, and undo. So move just basically is we're moving the mouse one of the four directions. So I could have actually set up move left command, move right command you know, that way, but I thought it's all doing the kind of the same thing. It's a little bit you know, easier to just call it a move class. We can store some data in it that tells us if we're moving left, up, or right, because we can actually store you know, information inside each of these commands of what it needs to be doing. And that's also how you would, if you're wanting to support undo, for example, you could store the state of whatever it was before you did that action so that you could undo it back. So say, it's, say, say you were wanting to undo some typing in a, in a text field, you could store the previous value of that text field. And if you did undo, that would be stored inside your class. And you just put in the old value, and you've just undone that typing. So we can store information in there, which is really cool. Reset basically just resets the game, goes back so the mouse is in the middle and the cheese is in the corner. And undo just you know undoes the action. So. Each of these, we have to. Uh, it, it implements the command type interface. Uh, like I just said, also allocates any storage that that command might need. And uh, these also have uh, what's called a receiver object. And uh, this confused me a bit because basically this setup is a little bit more complicated than I was thinking. But um, most, uh, in fact, there's a lot of programs that you're going to create. Um, you're going to have different parts of your program. Uh, in this case, I just have a big window that's the game window, and it's just a game. So everything talks to everything's going to all the commands relate to the game. But I can see a, a situation where you have an app, and you've got you know an, a, a, an edit field or a text area here, and someplace else you've got some other controls and different things. Well, your commands might be directed at one or the other, and they all go into the same queue 
of commands that you've executed, but we need to know, are they, is this, like, is, is this an undo for the edit field, the text area, or is this an undo for this text field over here or to you know, some other custom control or whatever you've got? Uh, you need to be able to tell which thing is which which thing is that command is talking to, and this by setting it up this way, y you can have as complicated a program as you want, and this will work. Uh, for the examples that I'm going to show today, it's just one object, so we just send self, which is the the actual window. And uh, oh yeah, and I also said that the the undo uh, history is stored into a command history class. It's just an array of command type objects that are stored in there, and Basically, I didn't implement redo, but all you'd have to do to support redo is create another class similar to command history, but just like redo history, and as the command pops off of the, you know, as you undo something and, and pop it off the command history, we just move it to the redo, and then if they wanted to redo, you just move it back, <laughs> and it'd be really trivial to add redo support. But I left that as an exercise for you guys to try on your own if you want. So to use this system, we first thing we do is we initialize sender class objects for each type of action. So that looks like this, and you'll see this in the code that I show you. But basically, we say in a new sender class, we use that its set command property to actually assign the command that we're going to do. In this case, we're doing a move a move command class. Self is referring to the window that we're or the object that we're trying to talk to that we're the receiver. And in this case, self would be referring to the game window. And the name of the command is left, is, is, uh, left move. Um, this part here on the right, move and direction left, which looks a little strange, it's actually a pair. And because what we do is, I set this up, it's actually it's storing everything into a dictionary. So when you want to store any data, you send it a pair and it stores in the dictionary and you can pull it back. So you could basically have as much of whatever kind of data you want that you can store in the command, whether that's information for what the command's supposed to do, undo information, whatever you need, you could store it in there. Here, I, I set up an enumeration for the direction, so there's just direction dot left, right, up, down, and then it's just called move because it's, it's just a move, and then which direction it's moving is, is the other half of the pair. So again, this would just, in the dictionary, this would be the key and that's the value. So it just stores it in there. Uh, any place we need to execute the move left command, like a menu bar, arrow key, you know, whatever your interface is set up, you just, all you do is this command right here. So, uh, you know, the, they hit the left arrow, send, sender left, execute command, right? So you'll notice execute command doesn't have like, we're not telling it what command to execute because we've already told that here. We've stored that command in there. So it's got the command already inside of it. So all we're doing is calling that object and saying, do what you know how to do basically. And it's gonna do it. And, uh, but it does mean when you're setting this up, it's a little confusing because you're setting up all these objects. And this is a very simple program. We've got like, you know, half a dozen, <laughs> dozen different types of objects because you have to set up for each of these things. But the cool thing is, once you do it, it just, it just works beautifully. So all the commands are automatically sent to uh, undo history. And uh, there's one exception for that is, is when you do the execute command, it actually returns a, a Boolean value. Uh, something I wouldn't have thought of, but returns a, a Boolean value. The fault is true, but if you pass it a false, uh, means that, it, that, that whatever command you were doing is non-destructive and you don't need to add it to the undo queue. So for example, like say somebody uses the copy command or they hit a command that brings up the help window or something like that, right? Those are non-destructive things. You don't need to say, you know, add undo to hide the help or something. <laughs> you could just ignore that and it doesn't have to be added to the queue. So that gives you a way to, you don't have to save every command that, you've, that the user has executed, you just save the ones that are destructive and add them to the undo queue. So I think that's the end of this. Yeah, okay. Let me do the demo on this and we'll see if you can follow along on that. It is, sounds more complicated as, but let me run, just run the demo first. It's not a very fancy demo, but basically by moving the arrow keys like this, I can use things like that. I can go up here to the move, left, down, Things like that, right? The cool thing is, if I go up here to edit, it says undo down move, undo left move, undo down move, and I can just 
use the thing and go all the way back to the beginning, and now there's no undos. <laughs> and uh, basically, what's cool about this is, again, the undo is almost like a happy accident that happens from the way that you've set this up, because all your commands are queued up. And, uh, and like I said, you can also use this for, for queuing commands if you had a system where like it's trying to talk to a server or something, the server's offline or the internet's offline. You could just queue up these commands once the server's back online, these commands could just run, you know. So you can use it for a lot of different things. And uh, here I'll show you. The mouse gets fat when he eats the cheese, so I thought that was fun. <laughs> So I'll show you some of the code in here. So first one is the command type, which again is, is just the, this is the uh, interface and it's, it requires these, these three things. This is the one that requires the Boolean uh, value at the end and has the name and the, and the name is just a string and then undo is just another method. That is required for that particular class, I mean for that interface. And let's look at the move class, for example. So you'll see it implements those those three methods are implemented there, and they're very simple. Name just returns mname, which is un, un, you know storage that it has there. Undo is pretty cool because it looks up in the in the uh, in the parameters um, that have been stored in it, which is is a, a property that we've added to the class down here. So it looks in there, looks up the move command, and finds what, what's in there. I just made it do direction left as a default if it can't find it. And then it just moves it the opposite direction, right? So it's left, it moves right, etc. And then it assumes game window. Here's the receiver, and it just uh, you know calls move. So I actually have, I probably didn't implement this in the best way because I actually talked directly into this window, so I probably should embed this in here. but. For the sake of a demo, it works. So the actual move, move method within the window is actually the one that does all the actual mouse movement. I just didn't store that in the actual property. The execute command as part of that move basically just, again, looks up the direction in the, in the dictionary and, again, just sends move there and it returns true so that we know that they've actually, uh, that that command was actually um, destructive and uh, that's pretty much it for that one. Um, sender class, this is the one that actually um, stores the command. So we have um, the actual command itself, which is a, it has to be a command type. That's the actual object that you know, holds the command. And this is the set command, which calls for you send it a command type object, and it stores it into M command. And then execute command, uh, this is where we check. So it calls m, com m command execute and looks for that Boolean value. If it returns true, then it adds it to the undo history. If it doesn't return true, it just doesn't add it to the history because we don't need to undo it. And that's how simple that is. <laughs> so the most complicated part about this actually, beyond the initial setting up the objects, is over here, sorry, it's over here in um, init commands. And this basically is where we set everything up. Um, I basically have, I'll show you my properties here. This is in game window. So these are all the properties we have to have. So some of this is the toolbars, but this is the main stuff here for the sender ones are all the ones that we have to have for the commands. So if you had a pretty complicated program with you know hundreds of commands, you'd have to have a lot of objects to, to handle all those commands. So I could see where it would be a little bit of setup. But the neat thing about it is once you get it set up, those commands can be, you know, queued and passed around and undone, and it, and the commands themselves hold all the code for whatever they're supposed to do. So if you if you have a problem with a particular command, you just you know exactly where that code is. It's in that in that object, and you can go, you know, fix it. Um, so here's where we, we initialize the uh, sender objects, and we actually store the move command or whatever the command, you know, whatever the command is inside. The sender object. So we here we're setting the various directions, left, right, up, down, you know, for all those. And then down here we set the reset one. Uh, when I was setting this up, I was like, do you need to undo the reset? And you know, normally in a game that just starts the whole game over and it sets. And I thought, well, we're not keeping score or anything, so let's just let let add that in as, as something we can undo. So basically, you can reset the game and then you can undo it. So <laughs> and then the last one is the undo object. 
And again, so all these say self because they're just sending in the, um, the game window object. And that's pretty much it for that. The move one we looked at, reset, just resets the game defaults, moves the mouse to the middle, makes sure the mouse and the cheese pictures are displaying, it refreshes, plays the little information. I have a little routine here to check to see this just checks to see if they're near the, if they're on the top of the cheese, and if the if they are, then it shows the fat mouse. So, <laughs> and then these are the arrow keys. So you can see here for the arrow keys, you know, they press left. We just call sender left dot execute command, right? So very simple. We do the exact same thing with the um, menus. So here's the down menu. We just call sender down sender execute, and if you had wanted to add other ways to, to send these same commands, that's how you would, you know, send those commands. So that is pretty much how it works. I don't know if it's confusing or not. I've been working with it a while, so it starts to seem kind of simple, but it, uh, when you're kind of starting out, it, it, it's a little confusing with all the different, you know, kinds of objects you have to, have to create. But uh, like I said, when I created this, I first did it without the, um, I didn't really show the, um, history command class. So there's the command class there. So I've got a few different things there. So um, so this is what I added to see if there is an undo available. So that when we enable the undo menu or not, if this returns false, then we don't enable the undo menu. So if there is undos available, we, we enable the undo menu. Um, and this one here called Basically, it gets the last, the uh, last item on the on the um, on the history file that just that array and uh, gets its name, and then that's what's displayed on the undo because that would be the last the next thing that we're going to undo is that last last action that we did, and uh, this adds the undo. So you just you're adding that command, and again, it's taking a command type object. So you can see, we use that command type object, that's what we're sending everywhere is command type object, but the actual command could be move class, redo, you know, undo class, and you know, it could be you know, any of the, of the action type things that you've created. They can all be different kinds, you know, the different kinds of objects. So, but because we've made them all the same interface, we can pass them back and forth to all these routines. So everything just works. But oh, I was saying that. Um, so when I first did this, I I didn't add the undo thing, and I didn't even have this the the uh, undo history class created. And then I'm like, okay, now I got to add undo. So I added that class, and it was like undo worked. <laughs> and it makes sense when I think about it because I'd already tested the rest of the program, so I knew the the commands were were passing, you know, were working, and they were passed back and forth, and they were working correctly because that's how everything was happening when I used the arrow keys or the menus. It's it's sending it's it's using the it's sending those command objects to the various parts of the program to, to have them execute, and then all the undo is doing is doing the exact same thing, just from that list that array. It's just popping off the end of the array and going yeah execute that you know execute that. And it was like yeah my code already works so I'm just doing the same thing again. So the undo just worked and I'm like that was the easiest undo I've ever had. <laughs> to enable it was like so the only thing I really added was the. The command down here to uh, um, to to tell me if the if if the undo was available or not because I I um, I noticed that my uh, you know I had to I had to basically enable that menu or not enable that menu and I said okay well I need a way to tell me if there is undos or not and uh, so I just added a, a command into the class to to return that and so up here on the uh, menu handler. I think that's where it is. Um, well, this I'll, I'll show you here. So yeah, so here's the edit undo. It just literally goes sender undo execute command. And again, it doesn't even know what that command is. It's just saying execute whatever command you have in your buffer, you know, and it does whatever it's supposed to do. <laughs> so I was looking for the, uh, oh, menu bar selected. Yeah, they changed it. I haven't used menus in a while. Um, so this, this is when you click on the menu to pull the menu down, uh, it checks, so it defaults the menu, the undo is false, the name of it is undo, but if there is undo available, it sets it to true and then whatever the last name of the action was. So that's why it will actually say undo left or right or whatever command you're undoing. So I think that pretty much covers it. We have lots of time for questions. Any questions about this specific thing or? 
You want me to show you something else with that, or is that pretty clear? Yeah, okay. Um, either you're all baffled or I'm really good at explaining. <laughs> so uh, these are some of the books I use for research for this. Um, this design patterns, I think these are the guys who actually invented or discovered, you know, set up the whole design pattern thing. It's a really old book, um, kind of like a textbook, very thick, you know, boring. <laughs> uh, middle one is the head first one, which is a little bit more friendly and, you know, got a pretty girl in the front, so obviously it's easy to understand. I don't know. Um, then you have design patterns, which this one here is one uh, more recent book that I found online, and I really like it. It's, he, he really covers it really well and explains things. I think he's Ukrainian or something, and I, I just found it online. I was like, this is really cool. And so I put, I uh, watched the thing earlier, or I guess it was yesterday, he um, did the demo and he showed the barcode class uh, demo in uh, Zojo, so I just literally today used that and added barcodes here, uh, QR codes, so you can get these. Uh, you don't have to memorize these long URLs. You <laughs> and I tested it, it actually works. I was like amazed, so it was really cool. I was like, never thought of that, but I hadn't really used QR codes, but I literally just used the demo project that comes with Zojo to make those a few minutes ago, and it took me like, you know, five minutes. So, uh, same thing for this one. This is the giant barcode for this. This is the download here, and you can grab that, and it'll, you can download all three. It has all three projects and everything you need to, to, to play with these, so you, that'll be an easy way to get the barcode, I mean the QR code. And uh, So now we got, yeah, we've got like 20 minutes for questions, if you got some questions. Uh, again, I don't know that much about design patterns. I know the ones that I studied a little bit, but <laughs> I'm a, I consider myself kind of a, you know, amateur professional and uh, just like to learn and explore things. And so, uh, you know, this is what I, um, th I, this, I find this kind of an interesting challenge for me to dive in and learn a new topic. So when, when I talked about this one last year going to London, I was like, I'm going to talk about something I know nothing about. <laughs> So this year I feel a little more confident because I've been studying it a while and, and have some ideas. But, um, but yeah, it's it's uh, I, I find it pretty ex it's some, some exciting things. These, some of these I'm really going to use a lot because especially the command one I'm like I can actually add undo to my programs now. So, <laughs> so any questions about any of that? You understand everything or? Um. Well, in the past, my, again, my programs tend to be mostly for me, so I'm not developing a big giant program that's, you know, going to have a lot of complexity and, and, and I'm answering to other people or anything like that. So I tend to not follow my own instructions and I just like start <laughs> off the cuff and just do, you know, I, I'm always kind of like, want to see, I want to see results. This is one of the problems with, with both object-oriented object -oriented programming and with, with um, design patterns is, is you know, I'm from the old days back, you know, when you had basic and you had an interpreter and it was like you typed in something and you got an answer instantly and it was like, oh, wow, I, something happened. You know, I typed something and I got something back. And, and uh, a lot of times with modern programs, you do all this work and set it up and, you know, you try to run it. And it's like your program's not even going to compile. <laughs> it's not going to, you know, because the, you have to build a certain amount of infrastructure before the program will even, you know, run. And then, of course, it doesn't really do anything because you don't have all the code for doing anything. And, of course, when you start adding objects and complications and a whole setup around it of what it's supposed to be doing with the complicated design pattern or, or something else, then you've got even more infrastructure you're building before the program will even work. <laughs> and so sometimes that can be a little frustrating and depressing because you're like, you got to do all this work before I get to even see if it works or not. And so I sometimes tend to just dive in and start, you know, programming and stuff. But I found, especially when I, the more research I've been doing into some of these design patterns, I, like, like I just said, the command one, I think when I start a new project, especially if it's one where I'm gonna want undo in it, I think I would set it up this way, because I just, it, it's a little bit of setup to set it, you know, to, to go originally, but I'm like, the benefits you get of that, I can see so many advantages of just being able to have your objects, I mean, your, anything your program is gonna be doing that the user's telling it to do is packaged in a command like that, that's really powerful. And it just makes it so easy to add undo and redo. And I'm thinking, you know, that's the way to go. So I think in the future I'll be doing a lot more <coughs> design patterns, thinking about them from the beginning and what I want to accomplish and, uh, and doing that. So does that kind of answer your question? <laughs> Any other questions? You got it? 
Well, I guess we're done. <laughs> All right.